All right, so uh, we've been talking about um, the, the biblical case for deliverance. And again, it always amazes me when Christians can't seem to find that. It's like, uh, you have read the Bible, right? Uh, because it's the theme of the Bible, is deliverance from evil. By the way, it is the disciples' prayer. The disciples said, Lord, what should we pray? And he mentioned uh, a number of things, but one of them is that we should all pray to be delivered from the evil ones. That's deliverance. That's why it has the word delivered in it. Deliverance. Uh, and it should be a regular part of our lives. It should be a regular part of our prayer. It should be a regular part of what we are able to offer others, okay? So um, we're taking a look at uh, all of these different cases in the New Testament of deliverance. Uh, in Mark 1, 23, 28, it says, Amazement gripped the audience. They begin to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this, they ask excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders, or some translations say words. And the news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. Uh, now, uh, this is a very important thing to understand. Uh, Evil spirits obey his words. And evil spirits obey our words as well because we minister uh, by the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, we had a water baptism on uh, Sunday. We'll have another one on Friday. And if you haven't been water baptized, I would highly recommend that you become water baptized there's a reason it was such a big deal to Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a reason it's such a big deal in the Bible. He who uh, believes and is baptized shall be saved. Um, and it's not to say that the thief of the cross, on the cross wasn't saved because he didn't get baptized. It is to say that it is a part of the normal process of any believer to make a lifelong commitment to Christ not just as your Savior, but as your Lord. There's a big difference. It's sort of like the difference between dating a woman and marrying her. There's a big difference, right? And so baptism is really like the rite of a spiritual marriage. And it's through baptism that you, became, that you become a name bearer. That is huge. By the way, if you're going to be successful in deliverance, you have to uh, understand the authority of the name that's above every name. I was at uh, a friend's house. He, he does a, a media network called United Intentions, a great guy. Um, and he's a pre-Christian, by the way. I hope you have lots of friends who are pre-Christians. Uh, if you don't, you're not doing very well as an evangelist. You need to get out and meet people and love people. And let me give you a hint. Love everyone with equal enthusiasm. Because there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are Christians and there are pre-Christians. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So uh, don't give them a hard time about being a step or two behind you. Everybody is on equal ground at the foot of the cross. We should love everybody. And um, we should have lots and lots of friends. You know what keeps pre people from having pre-Christian friends? It's the spirit of religion. Religion is ugly. Religion is always trying to make a fuss about some little thing. Uh, we have, over the years, uh, we have carefully guarded the environment here to make it uh, friendly and welcoming to all people except religious bigots. They, I don't want them hanging around here because they're mean and they have the spirit of Antichrist on them. And they're always picking at somebody because they did something wrong 
or wore their hat wrong. <laughs> uh, so anyway, <laughs> that's ridiculous. The spirit of religion is so ridiculous. But anyway, um, we, we don't want to cater to that. We, we want people to come in and find love and find grace. And we want to meet them where they're at and help them take steps toward Jesus. And, um, and if you don't learn anything else in your Christian life, learn to love people well. And uh, if you're going to do that, it's not because they line up with everything you believe and dress like you wish everybody would dress and talk like you wish everybody would talk. It's, it's not about that. Uh, it's about just l- loving people well. God loves everybody. Well, why shouldn't we love everybody? So anyway, um, uh, people usually are startled when they expect a religious experience and are met with the love of God. Let me tell you about one of those <laughs> stories. Uh, so we have a, a rehab, and we, have, we used to have a rehab right here on our facility, uh, and also the Feather River Men's Center, which uh, they're here. They have, yeah, come on, Feather River Men's Center guys. They're awesome. But anyway, uh, they are really awesome. They, they are the overcomers, and uh, I just love them. But anyway, <laughs> we had a guy that can't thank you, man. We had a guy that came in out of county, and uh, he was a big old boy like Frankie, and, and I was just, you know, trying to welcome him, and he was living on the campus, and he says, well, I said, uh, I hope I can stay here, but you're going to have to talk to my dad. And I said, is that going to be a problem? He said, well, don't let him intimidate you. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't intimidate particularly easily, but why would you say that? He said, because he's 6'5", and he's been the head of the Hell's Angels for 23 years, and he just tends to intimidate people. I said, okay, I'll watch, look out for him. So I saw this dude coming across the parking lot with his leg, right leg missing from the knee down. And he had, you know, uh, some of you don't know this, but anyway, gangbangers, since they can't legally pack heat, they always have something (laughs) that if they need to throw down in the showdown, they got something, right? And what he had was a silver club, and it had a big old skull on it that was so big that he had, you know, his two fingers in the eyes, and I saw him coming at me, you know, like, I thought, that boy could take your head clean off with that club, you know, he's coming over there, and so I went out to meet him. I said, hey, how you doing? He said, (laughs) he was this much bigger than I was, so he's looking down at me. He said, we need to get something straight right off the bat. I said, yeah, what's that? (laughs) He said, I think all religion is bullshit. (laughs) I said, well, at least we agree on that. Is there anything else? (laughs) And and he stepped back. He said, what? I said, at least we agree on that. Is there anything else you want to talk about? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were the pastor. (laughs) And I said, I am the pastor. And he said... Now I'm really confused. And I said, you know, the entire world is confused. The entire world's confused. Religion crucified Jesus Christ. Why would I want to be religious? Right? right. And so, come on, I'm sorry to block your way. Yeah, all right. But anyway, um, uh, so uh, that was the end of our conversation. I don't even know what he wanted to talk to me about, Kenny. But anyway, he just says, well, you and I are going to get along just fine. And we do. And he still texts me from time to time. He actually, the state was giving us a hard time one time. He said, you want me to round up some boys? (laughs) I said, no, we're going to be okay. Thank you very much. (laughs) But anyway, uh, listen, um, the world has not rejected Jesus Christ. The world has rejected religion that has misrepresented Jesus Christ. And so we got to get that straight. Okay. Um, so, demons must eventually respond to our words when we rebuke them. Now, um, my dad was, was a cowboy, and, um, 
and he was a gunsmith and he was a boxer and he was a very unusual guy. He also wound up being a pastor, but he was not your average pastor. And uh, so when we were young, he, he taught us to fight. And, uh, and he said, never start a fight, but by gosh and by golly, if one starts, you need to end it. And, and so that's the way we grew up, right? And um, by the way, I'm in a hearty support of that. Amen. You being a wussy does not help anything. And uh, if you think that meekness is weakness, you just don't understand God. Um, so anyway, um, so uh, I totally forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> yes, exactly, finish the fight. And whatever fight it happens to be, which I don't remember at this time, but uh, just finish the fight. Show up in the showdown and finish the fight. But, um, oh, this was it. It was the boxing connection. All right, so um, when we are dealing with demons, it is a fight. There's no doubt about that. But the weapons of our warfare are, are not carnal. They are spiritual. And one of the greatest spiritual weapons that we have access to is words. Do you understand that it is words that distinguish us as being made in the image and likeness of God? God is a spirit, right? But but he is a spirit who speaks words that have creative power in them, right? You say, oh, God's a man. No, God is not a man. The Bible plainly says God is not a man that he should lie. And, you know, uh, Brad Cummings is a friend of the house, and he uh, produced the movie The Shack, and people gave him hell because it portrayed um, the Holy Spirit as a black woman. I thought that was splendid. I, I just love that uh, because it addresses ridiculous religious um, uh, biases that cannot be founded in the Bible. And so, um, anyway, we showed um, the shack here, and uh, oh man, you talk about push the buttons of religious leaders. Like, oh, that's heresy. God is not a woman. I said, okay, well, it's not a man either. So, yeah. if he wants to show up as a lion, he shows up as a lion. If he wants to be a rock, he shows up as a rock. If he wants to be the wind, he shows up as a wind. And uh, so, anyway. Um, but the, the way that we're in his image and likeness is we have creative power in words. You say, well, not everybody does. No, that's not true. Everybody does. Uh, we pray for people all the time whose souls were marred by words spoken to them. You, and, and the Bible teaches that. I don't have time to go into that teaching, but oh, by the way, um, if you... If you want to find out more about this, uh, this whole area of spiritual warfare and deliverance, I have somewhere, hmm, is the silver bullet down there? Ah, thank you. Uh, I have everything I've ever taught on spiritual warfare and deliverance right here in this handy little silver bullet. Why would I put it in a silver bullet? Just in case you get into casting out a weird spirit. Um, but anyway, uh, the, this, I just gave this to Mark Gorman, and he's flying home, and of course they picked it up on security. Excuse me, sir, do you have a 50 caliber round in your brief, briefcase? And of course he told him, no, that the caliber is much higher than that. It's <laughs> but anyway, uh, if you're really interested in, in this, every, um, I, I, you know, we do this for a week, but I, I could do this straight for, for six weeks and never run out of material. I've been doing this for uh, 30 years, all right? So all of my PowerPoints, all of my teachings, all the MP3s, the, the videos, everything is on this silver bullet. So if you're interested in it, 
Uh, you can pick one of those up. Here, oh, Eva. Amen. Oh, it's mine now. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, uh, but, all right. So now, uh, the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are powerful. They have power to tear down strongholds, demonic strongholds. They have power to set people free. Again, uh, used wrongly, they have power to inflict deep wounds. Um, we were doing one of these uh, probably about 12 years ago, and, and um, a dentist from town that I'd been to, he, he came, and I knew he was a Christian man, and uh, he had a wonderful wife. I knew the whole family. He had a son and daughter. It was just a happy Christian family. He was doing really good in his excuse me, in his practice, and so he, he wanted prayer. So we went into office. I said, what's up, Doc? <laughs> and uh, he's, <laughs> he says, uh, he just put his head in his hands and started crying. He said, my father was right. I'm a failure. And it shocked me. I'd been to his house. He had a, he had a beautiful house. He, every person who's ever lived on the planet would look at that man and say, you are a success. Your marriage is a success. Your kids love you. You're, you live in a, a beautiful home. You're well respected in the area. You love Jesus. You are the epitome of a success story. And he has his head in his hands saying, my dad was right. I'm such a failure. And I said, did your father call you a failure? He said, yes. He knew, he knew, he knew I would never succeed. And I said, Doc, um, does your wife love you? He said, yes, but she probably shouldn't. I'm such a failure. I said, your son and daughter, they, they love you? Yes, but if they, if they only knew. And, and, uh, I said, you know, your dad was wrong. Amen. No, he was. I said, no, he was wrong. I don't even know him, but he was wrong. He word cursed you and said you'd be a failure. You're still living under that cloud. And that cloud is so heavy in your mind that you cannot see the plain and obvious truth that you, my friend, are a overwhelming success. And he just looked at me and he said, what? I said, you are a success? I said, write down what it would mean for someone to be a success. And he starts saying, well, a good family and, and health and, and a good business. And he wrote down his list. I said, which one of those isn't you? And he looked at him and he said, no, I've never really looked at it that way. And I said, that's because you've looked at it through the curse that your father put on you. And those can be very, very powerful, but they can also be broken off. And so we did that and we prayed and we broke them off. And I said, I want you to renounce the curse of your father, whether he meant it or didn't. And by the way, hurt people hurt people. That's how it goes. So don't just be mad at somebody from hurting you. Just understand that, that you would do the same thing if you don't get healed of your hurt. Hurt people hurt people. And heal people heal people. And so we have to be the ones that understand the process and stop the cycle um, that is a cycle of evil and destruction and the cycle of hell. But anyway, uh, our words are profoundly powerful. And um, it's really amazing when you begin to do deliverance. Now, again, we've already talked about the keys of the kingdom. We have the authority given to us from Christ to bind things that, uh, to disallow things, like we're not gonna let that happen. If we do that in the realm of the earth, that happens in the second heavens. Like, oh, they're not gonna let that happen. And if we allow things in the realm of the earth, then in the second heavens, they say, oh, we can do that. They're okay with that. It's huge. 
You would, wouldn't you expect it to be huge? Jesus called it the keys of the kingdom. You would expect it to be huge, right? It is. What we allow is allowed in the spirit realm. What we won't allow is not allowed in the spirit realm. I was, I was uh, I, we had this guy that visited the church and uh, he had been a counselor in, you know, some goofy stuff. And uh, anyway, uh, he's quite an outspoken guy, you know. So he came and he wanted to counsel the guys in uh, Feather River Men's Center and, and wanted to counsel the guys. You know, he, he just wanted somehow to hang a shingle out here and be a counselor. And, and I wasn't too fond of that idea. But anyway, uh, uh, he was uh, standing right out in the hall outside my office, and, and he said, he said, all this deliverance thing, I say it's bullshit. Yeah. This is not a great campus to hold that thought because <laughs> we do a lot of deliverance around here. I said, what? He said, I don't believe that for a minute. It's just people's imaginations. And I said, no, actually it's not. He said, well, agree to disagree, but I'm a counselor. I just thought, all righty then. Uh, we'll see how this plays for you. So anyway, that week later, I came out of my office because I'd been called to go across the river to a place where somebody um, that had been a Luciferian Satanist had gone fully demonic in an apartment complex and scared everybody out of the apartment complex and was threatening to kill himself or anybody that came into the room. So as the old song says, who are you going to call? It sounds like talking so they called me. So I said, okay, I'll be right over. <clears throat> I came out of my office and here stands this guy that had just you know, derided me for, for deliverance being BS. I said, hey, what do you got going? He said, oh, nothing. I just sw swung by to see what was happening. I said, ah, oh, jump in the truck. I'll show you what's happening. So <laughs> he had no idea. So we go driving over there, and uh, I'm, I'm talking to him about his, his counseling career. And I said, you know, um, around glad tidings, you're not going to, uh, win friends and influence people by taking cheap shots at deliver. Well, I just know, you know, he knew everything about everything. And, and uh, so anyway, he was rehearsing his awesomeness as we pulled up to this apartment complex where everybody was outside staring up at this room. And so I stopped, I, I said, uh, get, get out. He said, well, what's going on? I said, oh, there's a totally demonized guy up in that room. And uh, you and I are going to go up and talk to him. He says, dude, I don't, I don't want to go up there. I said, why? You afraid to get some BS on you? <laughs> he said, well, that, I mean, I'm a counselor. You, you need to call the police on that guy because you could hear him ranting and raving. And you know, <laughs> and so, so I said, no. Nope. I said, here's your choices. Either don't come back on the, the premises of glad tidings because of your insolent arrogance or come with me upstairs to watch what happens when a spirit-filled Christian confronts a demon. And so, anyway, he's, he came up sheepishly behind me and opened the door. This guy's in his tight whites and blood all over the place. And he's put his head through the wall in several places. And, and he's, he, he looks a mess, right? <laughs> and I heard him say, Oh, my God. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I said, you want to go first or shall I? <laughs> He's a counselor, right? Just talk to him. Help sort him out. He says, I don't want anything to do with this. And I said, okay. I said, um, I want you to stay here. I want you to see the whole thing. Because I never want to hear you say again in your entire life that deliverance is BS. And this should prove that to you. So... This, this demonized guy, he picks up an extension cord. And he says, I'll kill you both. And he comes over at us. And I said, well, you know you can't kill me, but you probably could kill him. <laughs> He's hiding behind me. He said, don't, don't, don't say that. 
And I said, well, how are you going to counsel a guy like that? And he said, well, I don't know, but don't, don't tell him that. And I said, listen, uh, Dan, you should probably stay in the kitchen until I'm done here. But I want you to, to watch what's going on because you're in harm's way here. And you're going to be a liability to me. So stand in the kitchen. You can peek around the door and watch what happens. And so the guy came up to me with the extension cord, says, I'll choke you to death, you so-and-so. And I said, you know that you don't have authority to choke me to death. <laughs> then I'll choke him to death. And he puts it, you know, around this guy that the spirit's manifesting out of. And I said, not, not on my watch, you won't. I came over here to help him. He's under my authority. And you will not harm him anymore. Huh, huh, I'll kill the guy in the kitchen. I said, nah, he's just a spectator. He said, just leave him out of it. <laughs> and I said, you know you don't have authority to kill anybody, so just drop the cord. And he started shaking, and then he dropped the cord. And then I started rebuking the demon, and he fell over. And I told my friend, I said, you can come out now. I think it's going to be okay. But uh, all that happened... By the authority of the spoken word. I didn't touch it. He, by the way, he came up and he put that cord right on my neck. But he knew that's as far as he could go. Just put it on my neck. And I said, you know you do not have authority to choke me. So just put the cord down. Now, uh, that was a confrontation uh, of which we've had many with an evil spirit. That remember, the testimony of Scripture is that all their thoughts were only evil continually. Those guys, their spirits are loose in the world to test the hearts of the sons of men. And they're very evil. And just like, you know, this congregation, different people, you know, have, have uh, different kind of problems. And some people have a problem with violence. Some people have a problem with lust. Some people have problem have a problem with dishonesty, right? My point is all evil spirits are unique. They're different. They're, they're what they call satient beings. They don't have a body, but they have everything else. They have a mind, a will, emotions. Uh, they have affections. They're, they're all twisted and demented, but they have all those things that we have. They just don't have a body, which is why we call them disembodied spirits, right? And because they don't have a body, they look for a human body that they can use in order to interact in this realm. And they have to, uh, they, they have to gain uh, assent. You have to uh, either actively or passively allow them to do what they want to do, which is why it's called topos, a license to operate. Uh, you're the one that gives spirits a license. And there's all kinds of ways you can do it. I was, <laughs> I was in a safe way uh, up in South Lake Tahoe, and this guy's wearing a shirt that says Incubus. And I, I walked by and went, you know, like, if he only knew. And the Holy Spirit said, and you're not going to tell him? So I turned around. He was picking out soup, you know. I turned around. I said, how you doing? He said, oh, okay. I says, you get raped often by evil spirits? And he's, <laughs> it kind of breaks into your soup choice, you know? And he, he, he said, what? I said, do you get raped often by evil spirits? He said, man, get away from me. You, have you lost your mind? I said, no, I haven't lost my mind. I'm an exorcist. I said, you, you realize your T-shirt's an advertisement for a certain kind of demon, and they happen to rape people. They're called incubus spirits. And he's just like, he said, no, no, I'm pretty sure this is the name of a rock group. And I said, it was the name of a kind of evil spirit, a very powerful, very malicious evil spirit, before they picked it up as the name of a rock group. And you're advertising for incubus spirits. Sooner or later, one of them's going to see you wearing their T-shirt. And he said, man, you are freaking me out. 
I said, that was my whole purpose. I said, I walked by you, and I just thought that poor guy's going to get raped at night, some night when he least expects it. And I, I, I said, God told me to turn around and at least warn you. And he said, he put the soup down. He said, what should I do? I said, well, quit listening to that music. He said, man, I got a lot of albums. I said, well, you have to sort that out. Raped at night, a lot of albums. <laughs> so you, you, you got to sort it out. And he says, so you want me just to throw them all away? I said, I, I would in a hot second. I'd throw them all away. I, I would forget every song you ever learned that was sung by Incubus. And I said, I'd lose that shirt, dude. <laughs> he goes like this. I said, not, not in the safe way. I said, they, they won't let you buy your, your soup if you have your shirt off. I said, just wear your shirt, buy your soup, and then when you get out of here, toss that shirt and never put it on again. And it was a short conversation like I just had with you. And he said, thank you, man. I had no idea. Yeah, and I said, well, you know, I, I'm, yeah. I said, well, I'm kind of in a hurry here, but I could tell you a lot of stories that would scare the bejeebers out of you. And he said, no, I've, I've heard enough. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so um, now when, when we are fighting with evil spirits, uh, our words have profound impact on them. Remember, you don't want to cross the line and allow them to interface with you on the physical realm because they have supernatural strength. Remember the demon and the Gadarenes. It says that many times they had tried to bind him with chains that he would break his fetters, okay? So you don't want to take something like that on in in the natural realm. And honestly, you know, uh, your, your only choice, I, I mean, if you have a gun, you can kill the host, but that really doesn't solve anything, does it? Because it's not the host that is your enemy. It's the evil spirit that is within those. So, so uh, you, you want to stay clear away from that, right? Uh, so, so it's our words. Now, when we use our words, and this goes back to my dad being a boxer, because, uh, but he used to, I have an older brother, and he, he used to train us how to box. And, and he'd say, if, if you can tag somebody, that's what he called it. He said, you can tag somebody. It doesn't matter where. You just keep on hitting them. He said, it doesn't matter where you're hitting them. In a rib, you hit it long enough, and they will go down. He said, you just keep tagging them, keep tagging them, keep tagging them. If they drop their guard, then you'll find someplace else to tag them. But he said, you just keep on keeping on. He used to say, you can lead with your right hand, you can lead with your left hand. Never lead with your face, because those people are called losers. <laughs> but anyway, but, but I learned about boxing. And, and my dad was a good boxer, and he, he, he uh, won a lot of matches just by finding the place of vulnerability and, and punching at it and punching at it and punching at it. Now, here's the, come on, bro. Uh, so here's the deal. Um, spirits lose power when they resist the command of a spirit-filled Christian. Please understand that. They lose power. And they may act all tough. And it has nothing to do with decibels. It has to do with speaking the word of God through your lips. Words have power, but your words never have more power than when through your mouth is coming the word of the Almighty. That is powerful. And when you, and you don't have to keep coming up with new phrases like, I already said I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Let's see. Uh, I oppose you in Yahweh's name. You don't have to keep coming up with new phrases, right? Just keep on punching. Keep on punching. Now, some of you have probably had Jess Parker pray for you. And Jess Parker was in on our first deliverance session, and we worked together for decades. Jess has a lot of, uh, he's a dear friend, I love him, has a lot of wonderful qualities. But his number one quality that sucker keeps punching. 
And, you know, this is a big ship, and I got a lot of things to do, and so Jess kind of t- uh, took the point of the spear on deliverance, and people would come in, and, you know, Jess would be going into office, I got a 10 a.m. appointment, you know, and I'd go by, and he'd say, I rebuke you, devil, you are gonna come out, I rebuke you, devil, and I'd come back at 11, I rebuke you, devil, you are gonna come out, you cannot stay, I'd come back at noon, I rebuke you, devil, you cannot stay, two in the afternoon, you cannot stay, eventually you'll have to go. I just thought, hats off to you, bro. That sucker, uh, he, he could, you know, be a, a sequel to the Rocky movies, right? You know, just keep on punching, you know? And, and you need to remember that. If you forget that, you'll think it's not working. Can you imagine a boxer, you know, uh, uh, taking a, um, you know, a, a, a few rounds and exchanging some punches and then just walking over to the corner and saying, I just don't think it's working. Like, what? It's the second round. Go out and keep punching. Of course it's working. Uh, and, and so that's the way spiritual warfare works. Just keep rebuking. Now, um, lots of, I've talked to many spirits, as you can imagine, and, and they've said, you know, most Christians, they won't engage us for more than about 20 minutes. And so we can take 20 minutes of verbal abuse from a Christian. But remember, every time you say, I command you in Jesus' name, come out. Every time you do that, it's like punching them in the chops. Now, eventually, even if they're acting like they're all that in a bag of chips, eventually, they get tired of being punched in the face by your verbal commands. And, you know, they eventually go. Now, usually right before they hit the mat, there's a flurry of, oh, blue smoke, you can't, uh, yeah. <laughs> right? It's usually the last final fling that they, they try their very best to intimidate you. But this is what I want to tell you, that demons must eventually respond to our words when we rebuke them. Actually, the Greek word for rebuke means to take a toll. You just keep taking a toll. Just, you take more and more and more of the moxie out of them. And eventually, they just throw down. Right? So remember that. Okay? Now, different demons have different strengths. Uh, and many times you're dealing with not a demon, but a demonic stronghold. And uh, we were telling the sh- story about Cheryl and the lady that had the putrid spirit, but there, there were six demons working together there, and one by one, from the, the weakest to the most powerful, she was able to, um, to ekbalo them, to force them to leave, right? Tell them to get the hell out of here. And so, one by one, they responded to that and, until finally uh, the, the woman was completely set free, and it has been free for the last 18, 20 years, whatever it was. So anyway, um, but remember that. It's the power of your words. And, and I'm saying that because I, I know that people get to thinking, well, I have to come up with a really cool saying. Like, K Ora S. <laughs> what time is it? You know, but <laughs> that's the story I told last night. But anyway, you, you don't have to. Just say, in Jesus' name, come out. In Jesus' name, come out. Uh, You need to know that because otherwise you don't understand it's a boxing match and you're tagging them on the chops every time you say that. Bam, 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 bam. And uh, eventually stuff starts breaking, right? Eventually they're done. And so I wanted you to understand that even Jesus rebuked demons with his words. And they left, and people were amazed, and that's why they said in that story, what manner of man is this? Even demons obey his words, all right? So, um, 
Ashley or somebody in the back, uh, we, we don't have a power cord here, so um, we're going to have to do something about that. Not sure what, but anyway. Um, the good news is I could go on for weeks without the... Um, I don't know how we're going to do that, Mark. You got no. USB-C? Well... I think if you plug that in there, it's... Do you have then it's going to defeat dong. you yeah. plug it into that. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, uh, okay. Uh, just forget we're doing this, okay? Um, so, um, let me... L- let me go on. The battery's going to die in a minute, and then I'll just tell stories for a little while, which uh, you'll probably enjoy. So, case for New Testament deliverance. Jesus casts out a legion of demons out of a man or two... In the uh, garrison or gathering, it's the same. Uh, it's the same story, spelled two different ways. But in the cemetery, we we know about that. When Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the gatherings, two men. How many men? Two men who were possessed. And that should be accurately translated. Who were under the influence of demons. Th- thank you, bro. I, I think it's more complicated than that. Uh, but I appreciate that. Uh, if, if we plug that in, this goes dead, so that's not going to help us. But anyway, uh, there were two men. They were under the influence of demons. They came out to meet him. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him and ran to meet him and bowed low before him. Now, just the last verse, there were two men. One of them saw Jesus and ran to him The other one uh, obviously did not run to Jesus. Now, uh, the the story then uh, follows the the man who ran to Jesus, and he's the one that had a legion of demons. A legion in in the Roman days was somewhere between 2,000 and 10,000. Under 2,000 was not uh, considered a legion over 10,000, they divided into two legions. So any way you slice it or dice it, that's a lot of demons to be in one guy. And so one of the guys ran to Jesus and uh, bowed low before him, and Jesus uh, freed that man. Now the other one, uh, we don't hear anything about, but, uh, but I, I think in all likelihood that had a very sad ending for that guy because he did not run to Jesus. That story ends with the, the people from the, the five cities telling Jesus to please leave them alone and go back across the lake. So now there's a guy with a legion of demons that are loose. He's running naked in the graveyard and there's no savior around to help him. So that had to end badly. Now, um, the, the one that ran to him, Jesus cast all the demons out of him. He was clothed in his right mind and said, Jesus, can I follow you as your disciple? Do you remember what Jesus said? He said, no, go back in the city and tell people what wonderful things God has done for you. Now, that's the kind of follow-up we're praying for around here. When somebody has a legion of demons, and an hour later, uh, they, they are good to go. And you just say, you, you go in and help people. There, there's all these demons loose, and they're going to need all the help they can get. All right? Now, um, demons can't keep their hosts from coming to Jesus. This happens, it's happened a number of times to us, it just happened recently, where somebody says, um, and it's always a manifestation of ego. They say something like this, uh, I hope you're good enough to cast my demons out. I got some really big demons, no one else could cast them out. Okay, so um, uh, in, in God's eyes, all demons are the same size, right? It's just like, it, it's not a thing, right? It's a demon. Uh, but people get to thinking they're all that in a bag of chips and they're, they're in some special category and uh, sometimes they'll say things like, well, how much do you know about satanic ritual abuse? Because I'm really complicated. Or, or what do you know um, about MKUltra? 
And I want to tell you something. You don't know, need to know about any of that stuff. What you need to know is about the power of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, listen, uh, God can unring any bell that hell rings. I call it unringing hell's bells. I'm going to remember hell's bells, the story and, you know, the song that nobody can stop the ringing of hell's bells. No, that is not true. It doesn't matter what has happened to a human being. The Spirit of Christ, without you becoming a uh, philosophical expert, the Spirit of Christ can fix whatever hell has messed up. You need to know that because otherwise, I, and I, I've, I've seen this happen to really good people that think, oh, well, I just didn't have enough beef. Baloney. It's not about your beef in the first place. It's about the Spirit of God. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you have access to infinite power and infinite wisdom, and nothing that hell has done to anybody uh, is, is equal to, to that conflict. You can absolutely drive out all the power of the devil. It doesn't matter what Nazi scientists program them. And we just uh, were rehearsing this with some people because uh, when, when Ray Ray LeVay came into our house, she had been through a whole lifetime of satanic ritual abuse. She was born in a satanic ritual in a power convergence. And she has been through six of the seven rituals of defilement. We didn't have to know all the details of that. We had to know the solution, right? And so... Um, and we prayed for her, and God helped us, and she, she had a wonderful attitude, and she was wholeheartedly into it and so humble. And things happened all the time, and we were just like, huh? what, about, what about them apples? I never saw that before. I remember the first time we were praying, and a fetish came up, right up out of her skin. Like, huh, didn't know about that. What's that? <laughs> And then we found, oh, that was a fetish that was put in through a certain uh, curse ritual. Like, huh, how about that? Uh, we saw all kinds of things that Jesus did for her. We didn't know about. Uh, sometimes we found out about in the process. Sometimes we didn't. Sometimes we just fasted and prayed and trusted God and saw God um, just, uh, we saw him, uh, he wrought miracles that were sensational, despite the fact that we didn't know every little thing about every little thing. You don't have to. You need to know God. We need to put our trust in God. And listen, I really feel strongly about this. Just recently, we had two MK Ultra people come here. And one of them uh, kept telling us how complicated her programs were. All MK Ultra programs are complicated. Uh, the other one. Uh, just kept saying, thank you so much for being willing to pray for me. Uh, one of them went home free. The other one just left. And, and uh, so I just want to underscore this. This isn't about you. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ overcoming death and hell and having all power in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That's in the hollow work. Right? That's what it's about. So you get to wear his badge on your lapel. That's awesome. That's what the concept of authority means in, in uh, the New Testament. And so let's do that for just a minute. Let's see here. Um, uh, let me see that. No, I want to see the... the um, the thing that is not there. Oh. Yes. Right here. Or I can't see it. Okay. So. Um, yes. Cheryl. So. The lunch break is at 1230. Right. We had a little question about that. But anyway. So let me tell you about. Um, about authority, and about power. Has anybody ever wondered why there are two different 
words that are used to tell us about what God has made available to us? All right, well, there's a really good answer to that. Authority is the right to do something. Now, uh, how many have ever been on the highway and someone sped around them and uh, were, were, was driving recklessly? Anybody beside me had that happen to? Okay, now, what you don't want to do is try to do a pit maneuver and throw them off the road and write them a ticket because you don't have authority to do that. And you might get hurt trying that, right? Because you don't have authority. Now, some little pencil neck dude struggling with acne <laughs> might be a sheriff deputy. I know because I met him. <laughs> okay? So, you know, a guy pulls up to you and, and the, your first thought is, does your mama know you're driving? <laughs> but you, then you see the badge. And then you think, oh, this guy's a sheriff deputy. So then you say, I'm sorry, sir. Uh, whatever did I do wrong, right? Now, you're not, it has nothing to do with the person. In fact, he might be your neighbor, and you know that his garage is a mess, and he never mows his grass. Not a good time to bring that up. <laughs> oh, you're going to give me a ticket? You who don't mow your grass, you're going to give me a ticket, Right? <laughs> you whose garage looks like a pigsty, you're going to give me a ticket? And the answer at that point is yes, and a very big one, right? But it has nothing to do with him as a person. It has to do with the fact that he bears authority from the state. It, it's a huge concept. So Jesus says, I have given you authority to cast out demons in my name. That's the right to do it. If you don't have that right, you probably will have a son of Sceva uh, experience. The sons of Sceva did not have the authority to cast out a demon. They thought they'd try anyway. And it says they fled bleeding and naked home. <laughs> I don't really want to avoid that one. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to pass on that. And so... Okay, perfect. All right. Um, thank you. Appreciate the, our technicians. Let's hear it for them. So, so um, that's authority. Now, Jesus says, I have given you authority and power over all the power of the devil. And you can walk among, anybody remember? Snakes. And scorpions, you can trample on them, but they cannot hurt you. What's that all about? Well, let's talk about it. Let's start with what he's given us. I've given you authority and power to trample on snakes and scorpions. Now, if you remember, Jesus introduced this teaching right after the disciples came back surprised and said, Lord, the demons are subject to us when we use your name. And, of course, Jesus was not surprised. The disciples were surprised. Lord, this worked. And Jesus said, of course, I was there when Lucifer was cast out of heaven like a lightning bolt to the earth, and I have given you authority and power. Over all the power of the devil, you can trample on snakes and scorpions, but they cannot harm you. That is an amazing promise. Now, authority is the right to act in his name. And so that's Jesus is the sheriff of the universe. But he's deputized you. That's what baptism is about, by the way. Baptism is being deputized to be a name bearer of Jesus Christ on the earth. It's a big deal. If you have not done it or did not know what was going on when you did do it, you need to get baptized uh, Friday afternoon or sometime soon. It's a big deal. And just because you don't know it does not mean that the spirit world doesn't know it. They absolutely know who's a name bearer and who is not. 
That's why they said to the sons of Sceva, really, Jesus we know, Paul we know, who are you? You got no badge on. And so then they jumped on him and, and uh, chased the boys away. So anyway, uh, authority is the right to act in Jesus' name. What is power? Power is the ability to get her done. Now, here's the difference. You don't want to go as a young deputy into a bar fight with a bunch of hell's angels armed only with your badge. <laughs> don't make me get ugly with this thing. <laughs> right? Yeah, they'll just beat you like a dirty rug and that'll be the end of that. So you may have the authority, but you need to make sure you, you also have the power. <laughs> right? That's the attention getter. Not only that he has the right to do something here, but he can flat pull her off. Okay, now, let me tell you a story about Buddha. If you're thinking, oh, I thought this was a Christian seminar. It is. Buddha got saved. And so uh, he's um, a sheriff deputy in town. He's an Indian man. He was named Buddha, but he gave his life to Christ. And so you can tell your Buddhist friend, Buddha got saved. But anyway, um, I was uh, doing this seminar a few years ago, and he was there. And I knew that he was a sheriff deputy, and he came up and he said, boy, do I have a perfect example for you in talking about authority and power. And Buddha, uh, he's a little guy, but he, he's a no fuss, no muss little guy. Like, you don't mess with Buddha. And um, so, uh, but he's of small stature. And so he said, I was uh, dispatched to a call. A guy had just paroled from prison. We all knew about him. He was a multiple offender, and he was violent. And we were expecting a problem, but we got a call that he was beating a gal to death. And so he said, I was first on the scene. He said, I, I came to his door. I heard her screaming. And uh, he said, I, I um, pounded on the door and I told him as the sheriff's department open up. He said, he opened up and the door and he's standing there and he'd been lifting weights, you know, in prison for 20 years and he's built like a Greek god and here's Buddha. Buddha's a little guy. Now, Buddha was in full uniform and he had the badge that showed that he was carrying the authority of the state of California. He had a right to be there. It wasn't just a neighbor or a passerby. He had a right to be there. And so the guy opened the door what do you want? He said, we know what's going on. Uh, we, we got a call from her cell phone and I'm going to have to take you in. And he said, you and what army, little man? Buddha says, you really want to go there? He says, yeah, I really want to go there. So he, he, they used to have these uh, uh, caller speakers, you know. They, they're very unpopular these days for reasons you're about to hear. So anyway, <laughs> he punches in the button he says, dispatch, this is badge number or whatever, and uh, I got a belligerent here. I need some backup. And so when you release it, then the dispatcher can talk to you. So he's standing there face-to-face -face with this big demonized guy. Dispatch says, uh, all units are um, tied up. Just proceed on your own. <laughs> the big guy goes, proceed on your own, little man. And so Buddha, he had the authority. The guy wasn't questioning, are you from the sheriff's department? He, he knew that he was. And he knew that he was in the wrong, and this guy had the authority to arrest him. What he questioned is, do you have the ability to get her done? And so Buddha pulled out his 40 caliber, jacked the shell in, drew down on his forehead, says, dispatch. This is bad number 451. I got a man down with a bullet in the head and two in the chest. Uh, he said, uh, send an ambulance. And the guy says, what? He says, uh, well, I just gave you a choice. You didn't want to ride with me. You can ride with the ambulance. They're on their way. And he says, well, you can't shoot me. He said, listen, pal, according to the official record, I already have three times that it's already recorded, you are down on the ground with a bullet in your head and two in your chest. 
So, get yourself in the back of my car or I'm going to fulfill that prophecy. <laughs> now, that changes everything. The guy said, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. You know, he got down, tucked himself nicely in the back of Buddha's car, and Buddha brought him in. Now, that's the difference between authority, the right to act, and power, the ability to accomplish what you've been given the right to act. Now, you're given the right to act when you're, you're baptized into the name that's above every name. It is a huge thing in case you're confused about water baptism. It is a huge thing. You become a name bearer in the realm of heaven, earth, and under the earth. It's huge, right? Now, it's the impetus of the Holy Spirit within you <laughs> that gives you the power to do what Jesus gave you the right to do. But what Jesus said is, I'm giving you both power, the right to act in my name, and, excuse me, authority, the right to act in my name. The, the, um, the Greek is azusia, and power. Uh, the Greek there is dynamis. It's where we get the word for dynamite. So I'm giving you both of those things. And, and we need both of those things to do business in the spirit realm, all right? So one of them, again, is the, the name that's above every night that you identify with and you, you are a name bearer in the earth. That's a, a wonderful privilege. The other one is the impetus, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and we need both of those, all right? But they've both been given to us, and why? Well, if we go on in the verse, he says, you can trample on snakes and scorpions, and they cannot hurt you by any means. How beautiful is that? Now, um, some people... Um, how to say this in a nice way. There are people that are so acluistic, not having a clue, that they think Jesus was talking about snake handling. <laughs> there was a guy, I got a picture of him there somewhere. It'd take me a minute to find him. He's got a big old fat rattlesnake at a communion table. It's like, Okay, my grandpa used to say, they got no head at all. Their necks just grew up and haired over. <laughs> just like, what are you thinking bringing a rattlesnake to church? How does that help anything? So this just happened, I think it was two years ago. You might have heard about it. Anyway, he's got his snake at church to prove he's all that in a bag of chips. And the snake didn't want to go to church that day. And it just turned around and bit him, and he died. That's a bummer. It, it's a bummer f for everybody. But, and he, I think he probably loved the Lord. I can only imagine his greeting by Jesus like, you did what? <laughs> Excuse me? That was about casting out demons. Right. Of all the ways you could have died, you died at a communion service with a snake, right? So I imagine he hugged him and then said, we have a learning impaired section over here. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you stay in there a couple thousand years and we'll see how you improve. But anyway, uh, this is not about reptiles. Uh, it's not about snakes. It's not about scorpions. It's about the fact that all the way back from Babylonian magic, all the way to the, the Ephesian magic in the day that the Bible was written, uh, evil spirits, demon spirits, that afflict mankind, there's all kinds of spirits, remember that, but, but de uh, disembodied evil spirits that uh, afflict mankind were divided into two basic categories based on they're, they're focused on what they attacked in you. And we are comprised of spirit, soul, and body. The Bible tells us that our spirits are incorruptible. 
That's a beautiful promise. Uh, devil can't touch that, right? We can sing along with MC Hammer on that one. Can't touch this. But the soul can be touched. Our mind, our will, our emotions, our affection. And the physical body can be touched. And that's uh, anything that per- pertains to our health and our life, right? So, uh, snake spirits and uh, Acts 16, 16, I mentioned that. I told you I'd get back to that later. This is later. So it says that she, uh, she had a python spirit, uh, which, which she knew supernatural knowledge, and she made money doing it, okay? Now, that obviously is a kind of a snake spirit, a python spirit. And the Oracle of Delhi were, was about python spirits. And you can find these kind of things. Uh, and it's not coincidental that when people go demonic, uh, most often they act like a snake. They, they can act in other strange ways. But most often they act like a snake because there are snake spirits that attack the soul. Uh, that's the mind, the will, the emotions, the affection. There's a million variations on the theme. But Jesus is talking about the evil spirits that will attack either your soul or your physical body. Now, both of them uh, can be devastating. And so um, the the, uh, demonic assignments against our soul or mind, will, emotions, and affection can be very devastating, but so can assignments against our physical body. Uh, I refer back to the woman who was a worship leader in this man's church, and she was well loved, and and they were in training to be elders. and And an evil spirit found a way to take advantage of her, and um, and had reduced her to a slave. She she had to live in her own room. She had to eat her own food. Uh, she couldn't uh, eat, she couldn't uh, pack her kids' lunches. She had two beautiful daughters. She had been uh, reduced to a slave of the devil without even realizing that the devil was involved. But it had to do with scorpion spirits that had the power to affect her physical body. And that's in uh, in pain, in sickness, in disease, in weakness. It is not God's will for you to be weak. It is God's will for you to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. A lot of Christians just have gotten used to weakness. Oh, I just, you know, I, I have this disorder that nobody knows about, but I'm just, it's chronic fatigue, and it's this and that, and it's all kinds of other things. Listen, there isn't anything that an evil spirit can do to the physical body that they don't have a big fancy name for. But you need to understand that it is God's will for you to live long and prosper and be in health as your soul prospers, right? That's God's will. The, the church is, is so anemic that we don't even know what it would look like to be a bona fide son or daughter of God because we're just used to getting our butts handed to us every time we turn around and, and we're just getting ripped off by the enemy. And, and we need to understand. Let, let, me, let me cast it in this light. Six million people came out of Egypt under the Mosaic Covenant. And it says there was not one sick or weak among them. The Bible makes it very plain that that was an inferior covenant with an inferior priest and inferior blood was shed with inferior promises, inferior, inferior, inferior... What about us today living under the new covenant sealed with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? But see, in our minds, we've just got used to the idea that, oh, just we're supposed to just maybe luckily make it through 70 years and, you know, God help us not to be too sick and, and forget all that mess. Moses, under the old covenant, lived 120 years and was in his full vigor and as strong as ever. And um, I know you heard my wife share, but my wife has been telling me for years, I'm never going to die. 
we got resurrection life. I actually bought her a, a um, um, I don't know what it's, it's a sign that you can put up anywhere in Florida. And it says, I plan to live forever. And then in small uh, letters under it, it says, and so far it's working. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, um, resurrection life is part of the deal. We're living way, 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 way beneath uh, what God has planned for us to live in. And that's why I think it's good for you to read about Enoch. Enoch transformed uh, in, into a light being uh, of extreme glory in the Old Testament system. That's pretty amazing. Metatron, the guy that showed John around the, the heavens, right? And said, oh, don't, don't worship me. I'm a prophet like your brothers. I, read the, I obey the same words of the book that, that you're writing, the Bible, right? He, was, he wasn't an angel. He was a glorified human being that, oh, yeah, just like Paul said, was ruling over the angels. That's pretty awesome, I think. Y'all are looking at me like a calf staring at a new cattle guard. (laughs) That's pretty awesome. And you know what's holding us back? Is vain traditions handed down from our fathers. That's what's holding us back. Because people don't talk about this kind of stuff. It's like, oh, yeah, you're fat and ugly and will die soon, but at least you're going to heaven. (laughs) What kind of a deal is that? Right? Uh, the, the whole idea of what Christ meant to have we owe sons who rule and reign with him has been shortchanged by Augustinian theology. And we need to, to trust God to... Actually, Paul prayed uh, 2,000 years ago. He said, I'm praying that your minds will be enlightened so that you would be able to understand the gloriousness of your high calling. So your, your minds need to be renewed. You won't even be able to get it unless God does something to your mind to help lift your vision from the mundane ugliness of organized religion. And guys, it's, it's ugly. Organized religion has been very, very ugly and has misrepresented Christ. That's what the world has rejected, not Christ. And so we need to re-present him. And that's going to, uh, we're going to have to get over hardening of the categories. We're gonna have to going to push away from a lot of stuff that's vain tradition handed down from the elders. But, but that's what is going to happen soon. And that'll be the great division Uh, in our lifetimes is between organized religion and authentic Christianity. And and it's well underway. So anyway, so um, uh, Jesus gave us authority. That's the right to act. He gave us power. That's the ability to accomplish what we have the right to do. And it's over uh, all of the spirit realm. And, And what I mean by that is the demonic realm. Now, there are many, many other realms and there's the realm of the second heaven. And, and that's really none of your business, okay? Uh, those are not demons. Those are fallen gods. Those are the elves that the Bible talks about. They rule in the second heaven. They are very powerful. Now, again, if God anoints you to do something, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But in terms of just thinking, I just think I'll purge the second heavens. Uh, no, no, you're not going to do that. Not, not until it's time. Remember Gabriel, who's a face angel. That, that's one of the angels that stands before the face of the almighty God day and night. Gabriel, trying to get through the second heavens, was apprehended by one of the gods of the second heavens. He was called the prince of Persia. And he said, hey, this is our domain, Gabe. Y'all can't come through here. And Gabriel fought with him. It's in the Bible. It says he fought 21 days and still couldn't get through. But Michael came. And when it comes to spiritual warfare, Mikey likes it. (laughs) 
And so Michael came kicking butt and taking names and Gabriel went on through and then he said, and so I'm here now, but I'm going to have to get back through the second heaven and, and I'll have to confront the, the prince of Greece. And because the story that we have came from that experience, we don't have that recorded. But you, you can bet your bippy that he had to fight with the prince of, peace, of Greece on the way back. And so that's second heaven stuff, right? Now, the reason I'm saying that is there's a book called Needless Casualties of War, written by a good man who knew what he was talking about. I, I don't often talk about it because I'm trying to get people to be more courageous and more heroic and do more stuff. And Needless Casualties of War, to some degree, gives people a hall pass to be a little more passive, which I don't like. But the guy who wrote that book is a good guy. And he was talking about a naive Christians who don't understand that Jesus specifically told us to cast out demons. The disembodied spirit of the ancient evil dead. That's what we're supposed to cast out of people, right? But you can get in trouble, and I've known this to happen. Uh, that people go over and say, I'm going to take on Diana, the um, ancient Artemis, the, the patron goddess of witchcraft. Like, mm, I wouldn't do that. I think I'd just pass on that. Why don't you just like stick a sharp pencil in your eye and call it a day? <laughs> I, that, that's not going to go well for you. But I've known people taken clear out because they've done something like that. And the uh, first time I went down to Mexico to be with David Hogan, um, he's down there at the Temple of the Sun. If you haven't seen the movie Apocalypse, you should, you should watch it for its historical significance. Because that's the dedication of the Temple of the Sun to Quaxacotl, the serpent god of Mexico. And that's what empowered evil in Mexico. And it, it is still, uh, still deeply entrenched in, in the unstable region of Mexico. Uh, the, uh, there is incredible demonic power. And they can do everything except raise the dead. Uh, and... Uh, so getting to know David, and I've been down there a couple of times, and it's, it's a whole different world, but uh, his elders have to have a verifiable resurrection <laughs> or, or that you can't be an elder down there. That means somebody has to be verified dead. No, they weren't just sick. They didn't faint. They were dead. Right? Like the princess bride, uh, mostly dead all day. That doesn't work. You've got to be verifiably dead and by the power of the name of Jesus, you got to call their life back into them or you can't be an elder. And I, I said, wow, that's, that's extra biblical. I mean, he said, no, it's not. You can, uh, just because it's not in the list of elders doesn't mean I can't add it to the list. <laughs> I said, well, David, that's kind of what I meant by extra biblical. But anyway, he said, well, he said, it, it doesn't work down here. He says, these warlocks, they can shape shift, uh, they can transport, they can uh, fling death curses. He said, these, these uh, Aztec warlocks can do everything with spiritual power except raise the dead. He says, they can't do that because Jesus Christ specifically took the keys of hell and death with him when he left, when, in his resurrection, right? And he said... What gets their attention down here, uh, 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 healing people, transporting, uh, changing shapes, um, you know, uh, calling stuff out of the second heaven realm, none of that gets people's attention. They do it all the time. You raise the dead, they say, okay, now that, that's something we can't do. That is uniquely Christian, the power to raise the dead. And so anyway, um, uh, we, the, the conflicts that we have, uh, we have power over demons of any kind. We have the right to take them on. And uh, we need to know that, that uh, what God has called us to and what God has not called us to. And the reason I brought up David Hogan is when we were down there at the 
Temple of the Sun. I said, hey, David, you ever been to the Temple of the Sun? He said, yep. Why? I said, well, just ask. He said, you were not? I said, uh, I wasn't. He said, nope, you want to go, and I'm not going to take you. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's fair. Why not? He says, it's a big pile of rocks dedicated to the devil, and it almost killed me when I went there to take a picture. He said, my wife, Debbie, was sick for two years because of a curse that came out of those rocks. And he said, I will give my life for a human being, but I will not give my life for a pile of rocks. He said, those are not demons at the Temple of the Sun. They are the fallen gods. And I'm not going to take them on unless Jesus tells me to go there and do that. And I said, thank you, David. That probably uh, preempted an early death for me. But um, there's a big difference. And so remember, you're called to cast out demons. Don't, don't try to take on Baal or Ashtaroth or, or Molech or Diana of the Ephesians, they are not demons. They are fallen gods, and they are very powerful and will scoff at you if you are outside your realm of authority trying to be all that in a bag of chips, right? Just do what Jesus told you to do. He's given you authority, and he's given you power to cast out demons, and all of us should be doing it, all right? And then now... Uh, John the Beloved, if you know history, uh, John the Beloved crawled up on the altar of Diana. That's where they all went into a demonic frenzy and said, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And, blah, 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 and says the whole multitude didn't even know why they were assembled. They, it was a demonic um, orgy is what was going on. And, and so John the Beloved went right back to that same place and he He went into the temple of Diana and he stood on the altar and rebuked Diana of the Ephesians and the altar broke in half and a great revival came to Ephesus. Now, can you do that? If Jesus tells you to do that, yes, you can do that. Remember David? The difference between David and Saul is uh, Saul just did things of his own initiative. David inquired of the Lord, should I go up against the Philistines? If I go up, will you deliver them to my hands? How should I do it? Now, that's what we have to do to live the spirit-filled life. And I've been up on the altar rock and I took on the ancient ones up there and sometime I might be able to tell you the story. But the first thing that happened when David Hogan heard about it, he said, little brother, did God tell you to do that? I said, yeah. He said, I hope so. I said, "I'm, I'm sure he did. He said, well, you know, he said, you, you know, you just took an ancient one and kicked him in the crotch pretty hard. <laughs> I said, well, that was my intent. He says, okay, okay. But just remember, you don't get to be a prince over the demons by losing wars to men. And he said, let me just tell you something. I believe that God told you to do that, which is why you're still alive. But he said, the rest of your life, you're going to be fighting the fallen ones. I said, well, that's what I think I was called to do. He said, okay then, okay then. He said, that's the deal. You take on them, and it's a lifelong assignment. And so anyway, that's why we've been doing these conferences for 30 years, uh, is because it's something we're called to do. But my point in telling you that is, Uh, because you have the Spirit of God within you, if God tells you to do something, you can always have confidence to do it. Uh, It may not be easy. I mean, my life is fun, exciting, and it ain't easy, right? Uh, But God will empower you to do what he wants you to do. Uh, In terms of casting out demons, you don't need a voice when you got a verse, We've already been told in the Bible, this is for everybody who names the name of Christ. I have given you power. I've given you authority. Cast out demons in my name, and you can trample on the snakes and the scorpions, and they can't hurt you. That's for every one of us. 
So, uh, all you um, uh, sheriff deputies, stand up, please. <laughs> all of you imagine Jesus pinning his badge on your lapel and commissioning you to go and do what he has called you to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you uh, for your spirit. We thank you for the authority that you've given us. We thank you that your name is above every name. And uh, you've allowed us to operate in that name, in that authority, and with that power that comes from your precious indwelling Holy Spirit. Pray, Lord Jesus, that you would teach us to carry the authority well and wisely. And Lord, we pray for more and more power from on high, Lord Jesus. Endue us with power from on high to destroy all the work of the devil. We pray these things in Jesus' name for Jesus' sake. Amen.